Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9. We enter into what's been called a, a hymn. I'm not sure it was actually a hymn. It certainly has a lyrical quality to it. It is exalted prose as Paul describes something beyond our imagination but not beyond our adoration. Gordon Fee, describing this passage, says, Here is one of Paul's finest hours. Here is one of Paul's finest hours. And beyond even Paul, it gives me great joy to think about the Holy Spirit himself inspiring these words to describe God the Son and the Father smiling over them as they were written and even as we read them this morning. Let's begin reading in verse 5, Philippians chapter 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. We recently took the family, just for the fun of it, uh, to the Bass Pro Shop store, uh, not because we wanted to buy anything there or would even know a number of things that you should buy in that store, but we wanted to wander around and let them kind of look at everything that's there. So we took a picture with the eight-foot bear. We looked at the fish uh, that were swimming around. Uh, and then we wandered the aisles looking at the various camping equipment and outdoors equipment, and my kids loved it. And, and one of my sons in particular was delighted to find out that they sell metal detectors. And he spent a good portion of our next few minutes trying to convince me that I needed to buy him one. I needed to buy him a metal detector. And I can understand the appeal for a little boy of a metal detector. It is as though the treasure possibilities are endless and lying right beneath our feet. If only we had a means of discovering, who knows what kind of treasures we might. If I could just imagine him thinking about holes in the backyard and, and wandering and thinking, oh, look at this treasure I've discovered. Dad, you never know. You never know. We might be fabulously wealthy and not know it because if only we had a metal detector, we could discover treasure hidden right below the surface. <laughs> you know, I, I think Philippians 2 is a glory detector for us. It gives us the opportunity to see a glory that lies just beneath our familiarity with Jesus Christ. It gives us the ability to to see what we in our own limitations cannot see, what our, our own eyes cannot see. It gives us the ability to see something that natural mankind counts as mere dirt, as actually the concealment of glory. Philippians 2 is a a glory detector. It gives us the ability to see what we can't see on our own. And Paul and God want us to see the glory of the humility of Jesus Christ. If there was a goal for this passage, I think that would be it. That we would glory in the humility of Jesus Christ. That we would see it. That we would revel in it. That we would unearth it. 
Behind all of our familiarity with the story of Jesus, perhaps even our awareness of his humanity, our awareness of the story of his life, death, resurrection, we could perhaps still be veiled to the glory that lies just below the surface of those plain, ordinary facts of that plain, otherwise ordinary man from Nazareth. Paul invites us to detect, to see a glory in the humility of Jesus Christ. I want to invite us to dig this morning. I want to invite us to see the treasure that lies right before us. This passage is broken into two unequal sections, very unequal. The second one is is much longer. If you look down at your Bibles, you notice that verse 5 has a command component. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The essential command in this verse is that we would reflect the humility of Christ. We would reflect it. Uh, and, And yet, this reflection requires an original. And so Paul also uses verse 5 to transition from his commands about humility, which he's been going on about for a few verses, and to get into the great original, a celebration, a, an ode, a hymn, a, a glorying in the humility of Jesus Christ. He, he first commands them to reflect that humility And then he talks about the revelation of that humility in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Those will be our two points this morning, unequal points. Reflect the humility of Jesus Christ, and then the the revelation of the humility of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the the command to reflect beginning in verse 5. Paul is concluding a series of commands that we talked about last week. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The this points backward and forward at the same time. This mind is the mind of humility that counts others more significant than yourselves. It's the mind that looks not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. It's a mindset, a perspective towards life and towards your rights and your dignity and your ambitions and your goals And Paul wants us to have a humble mindset, a humble perspective and ambition of life. And this also points forward, because after commanding and describing the type of mindset that we're to have, he then states that this is the mindset that was present in Christ Jesus. That phrase there, which is yours in Christ Jesus, you may have in your Bibles a little footnote. Uh, it may, may say uh, a little note at the bottom, may something like, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's probably a better translation. The idea is you're to reflect in your everyday life a mindset that was first revealed in Christ Jesus. You're to reflect something that has already been seen and is displayed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. In other words, the humility that we're to have as a church is not a humility that we create ourselves or that we come up with or that we mutually agree upon is beneficial in society. It's a humility that we are reflecting, we are imitating, we are to have by virtue of our having seen Christ Jesus by the Spirit and being united to him by faith. It is the humility of Christ that is meant to be seen in the life of the church. It's not our own definition of humility. It's not a cultural definition of humility. It's the actual humility of Christ reflected through his body to God as the ultimate audience and also to the world. We're to reflect the humility which was also present in Christ Jesus, Paul would say. Humility reflected. God wants to see the humility of Christ in the character of his people. Now, he's going to go on to describe the magnificence of the humility of Christ, but he begins with this command, this this exhortation. Have this mind in you which was in Christ Jesus. And because of our sin and our weakness, this humility will only be seen imperfectly among us. But I don't want to miss that this is, is what Paul defines as one of the ways we live worthy of the gospel. One of the ways we can say 
that we are being faithful to our God and to be a Christian is that the mindset of Christ is present and glimpsed, however imperfectly, but glimpsed in our lives. Humility is essential to Christian faithfulness. There is no Christian faithfulness without Christian humility. Pride, we might say, is one of the most essential characteristics of unfaithfulness in the life of the Christian. Pride is not an occasional uh, unfortunate habit. It is an essentially damaging and dangerous witness of our identity in Christ. Pride is essentially anti-Christian. It is anti-Christ. To promote our own interests, to look out for ourselves primarily, to be looking for how we can take advantage of every situation is to be anti, to conceal, to fail to reflect the image of Christ and his humility towards us in salvation. Christians that are real Christians are Christians because they are united to Christ, and that Christ is incredibly humble. A proud Christian is a contradiction in terms. It is a a blasphemy of Christ to be proud. And it is a concealing of the glory that God means to be revealed. Our humility is meant to be a glimmer, a glimpse of the humility of Jesus Christ. Pride and conceit, self-confidence is not bad only because it offends others or it disrupts our unity. It's bad because God intends to look at us and see a reflection of the humility that he will exalt in his son. He wants to see Christians, little reflections of Christ, and a chief characteristic of Christ is humility. He saved us to show his humility through us. Now, this gives us incredible motivation when it comes to opportunities of being humble. It turns humility from a shame and a chore to a glory and an honor because we are quite literally reflecting God the Son to God the Father. It turns opportunities of hiddenness and concealment of our own exaltation into moments of exaltation because we are showcasing the very humility that is seen in our salvation. It turns a a humble moment behind the scenes into a glorious moment to be craved and desired for the Christian. Mothers, this means that when you lay down your lives for your children in the power of the Spirit, you're not just setting a good moral example to them. You are giving them a glimpse of the humility of God the Son. Fathers, when you prioritize your wife and her interests ahead of your own, you are not just demonstrating the path to a fruitful marriage. You are giving her and your children a glimpse of the humility of Jesus Christ. Church members, when you give up your home or your time or your food budget or your vacation money in order to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ, you are not just being a nice, generous, benevolent person. You are giving people a glimpse of the humility of Jesus Christ. The call to humility should also grieve us to think of the pride and self-centeredness that is too often present in our lives. It is not just an annoying trait. It is not just the way I am because it's the way my father was and I grew up that way. No, no. It is a concealment of the humility of Jesus Christ meant to be seen. Have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. My wife loves sunshine. She loves it. She does not like clouds that conceal the sun. She doesn't like curtains, except at night. Um, Curtains are okay at night. There's no sun outside. When there's sun outside, there should be light. So one of the first things that she does in the morning is to open the curtains and the blinds in our home. And occasionally, if she's gone early in the morning, and I'm the one that's gotten up and, and you know, started to get the household moving and whatever, occasionally she'll come back and find, to her surprise and dismay, that the curtains are still closed. 
And it's this impossible confusion to her. Why, why would you exist without the sun when the sun is available right on the other side of that curtain? Well, God would ask the same question of us when it comes to pride. Why would you conceal a display, a reflection of the humility of Jesus Christ? Pride is a concealing, it is a covering up of that great glory that is the ultimate treasure of mankind. It is a covering up that is to be our main purpose. It is a window that intentionally shutters itself. No. Pride is eminently satanic. Because it seeks to conceal the glory of the Son of God. And so pride should be hated by every Christian when they see it in their own souls. Not tolerated, not just minimized, not just curtailed, hated, despised. Open up and let the world see the humility that reflects the humility of Jesus Christ. Humility reflected. We were meant to be windows, not shutters. We're meant to be transparent so that his humility can be reflected in us, not shuttered so that all the world sees is the typical darkness of human arrogance. Now, humility is hard. Fighting pride is hard. Getting our eyes off of ourselves is hard. And on to others is hard. Paul is saying that this humility, this humility requires a sight of something. The way to fight pride and reflect Christ is to look at Christ. You don't place a window intended to give light against a wall in your home. You place a window towards the outside where the sun can come in. A window does nothing if it's facing a wall in your home. A mirror does nothing if it's turned against the wall. It must face the light, and the Christian must face the sun if they are to reflect that sun. That's the logic that Paul is giving here. Have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, and then he begins his extended celebration of the humility of Jesus Christ. And Paul, as Gordon Fee says, this is one of his finest hours. He just displays in line after line and lyric after lyric, the glory of the humility of Jesus. And he invites us to gaze at it. He invites us to see it, to to revel in it, to soak it in, to see it and to be amazed by it and to be worshipful of the one who displays it. There is the reflection of Christ, but there is also the revelation of Christ's humility. Let's begin reading this revelation beginning in verse 6. What was the humility of Christ? Paul will describe it. This Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, I think you can perceive at least three stages. You could probably divide it different ways, but perhaps three stages that reveal this humility. The first is his mentality in heaven. Before any action is taken, we want to notice something. Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Let's just notice his mentality before he ever takes any action. We want to notice this phrase, the form of God. Gordon Fee says, the form, the word there means that which truly characterizes a given reality. It is, it is not form in the sense of merely the appearance of something. It's form in the sense of he possessed in himself all of those things which characterize deity. 
We might use the theological term, his divine nature. He was by nature God. He was by form God. All of those things which characterize deity were true of Jesus Christ. And you see the the carefulness of the biblical writers to defend the doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus was not all of God because there is God the Father and God the Spirit, but he certainly was all that God is. He was the second person of the Trinity. All persons equally God, all of one essence. Each is God, and yet they are not the same persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Paul is is carefully working around. He was in the form of God. He possessed all of the attributes that are true of God. He was divine. But here is the shocking statement. Though this is the case, He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Here's his mentality in heaven. This is the first window into the humility of Jesus Christ. So for eternity past, being in the form of God, being God himself, God the Son, he didn't count that position, being the equal of God, and here's this very difficult word. Uh, in the Greek, it's a very difficult word, and people struggle with how to, how to describe it in the English. It, it has to do with this idea of, of using something to your own advantage, of, of grasping. It, it might mean uh, simply the action of grasping to your self-benefit. It might also mean uh, a, a thing which you hold on to. In, in either case, the idea is the same, that Jesus did not count equality with God as an opportunity to grasp for himself either the rights of that equality or of anything else, he rather, as it goes on to say, saw it as a calling to empty himself. So the very equality with God that God the Son has is not an occasion that Jesus uses to promote himself or exalt himself or to grasp for himself. He is a non-grasping deity. I could use a paraphrase. He's a non-grasping deity. He's a non-selfish advantage deity. He is a non-opportunist deity. He, he is a, he is a non-using the position of equality of God for himself deity. And this is his eternal mentality. God the Son views his godness as not an occasion for grasping, but for giving. The very nature of God the Son in eternity is a giving of himself and not a taking for himself disposition. This was not unique to his humanity. It wasn't though Jesus became a servant when he entered Mary's womb and walked the streets of Nazareth. No, this outpouring disposition, this non-grasping disposition, this not looking for your own interest, non-grasping disposition, this is an eternal quality of God himself. If you've never read the book Delighting in the Trinity by Michael Reeves, I would highly recommend it. I would hi- most books on the Trinity are technically accurate and not particularly stimulating. This is the opposite. And what Reeves talks about is how the Trinity itself is constantly outpouring love towards one another for eternity. The Father outpouring love on the Son. The Son outpouring a willing servant-heartedness towards the Father. The Spirit constantly looking for ways he can exalt the Father and the Son. There is this outpouringness that is essential to God himself. God is in his very nature servant-hearted. He is in his very nature non-grasping. He didn't by necessity become that way because of sin. He was that way for all eternity. This is the God we serve, a non-grasping kind of God, an outpouring kind of God, a servant-hearted kind of God, a not taking to your own advantage kind of God. This is what Paul is saying. Being in the form, having all the characteristics of God, he didn't count even that a grasping opportunity but made himself nothing. This was his eternal perspective. Now, we have never possessed anything that is even in the smallest, minute (laughs) fraction of the value of being equal of God himself. Our most valuable possessions and rights are a penny 
compared to the oceans of gold that is the glory of God himself. The most valuable possessions of all humankind are a grain of sand compared to the full coastline of all that is the glory of God the Son. Yet for eternity, he counted all of that glory as not an occasion for grasping. His essential nature was giving rather than grasping, sacrificing rather than clinging. This is the way he viewed his highest, most valuable honor. Do me a favor. Hold your hand in front of you just for a moment. Just there, there at your lap. Hold it in front of you. And let's imagine for a moment your most valuable possessions and rights placed there. Perhaps your full net worth placed there in your hand or your job or your family or your best friendships, or your dreams, or your house, or your looks, or your intelligence, or your physical strength and health. Imagine that it is all placed there. Would you consider closing your fingers around any of it? If it was all placed there? I would. All of those things combined from all of our hands are as a grain of sand compared to the glory of being God himself. And Jesus did not grasp at that equality as an advantage for himself. This was his eternal perspective towards his father. This is the glory of the humility of Jesus Christ. For Jesus, his eternal perspective was that his godness was an occasion for self-giving and that he reveals the true nature of God in his non-grasping for eternity past and then in taking action in his incarnation. It's revealed not only in his perspective, but in his action. This perspective took action. Notice verse 7. He made himself nothing, taking the form, there's that word again, of a servant. That's a bond servant. That's a slave being born in the likeness of men. This is the second section. He uses this non-grasping intention of pouring out to take to himself the form of a servant. He makes himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Now, I want to zero in on this phrase, he made himself nothing. He made himself empty. He emptied himself. What what does that mean? Now, there's been great debates over what that means. Uh, Some people might say, well, he emptied himself by he ceased to be God. He gave up his godness while he was on earth. That's that's what he emptied out of himself. Or some people would say, well, he didn't stop being God, but he stopped having the prerogatives of God. He stopped having the attributes of God. Or some people say, well, he didn't give up all the attributes. Uh, He was still loving and kind. He represented God, but just not all of his power and his wisdom and his authority. And yet theologians have rightly challenged that idea as saying, well, first of all, it doesn't say that he did that. So you can't assume that that's the case. And secondly, that creates a mass of theological problems. If God the Son gave up his divine nature, who is holding the world together? Since that is his eternal job. So how does that work? If he emptied his divine nature out of himself then how can it be that we are still in existence or that Nazareth was when he was walking around in it? So no, throughout the ages, theologians have said, no, that's that's not what he emptied. He didn't empty his divine nature. The the word nothing there, it, it quite literally is defined by the next couple of phrases. And as is often the case, if you bump into a Bible problem, if you, if you just keep reading, most of the time, it's much more clear. What did it mean that he made himself nothing? Well, he did that by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. So theologians call this subtraction 
by addition. It makes no sense in the human world, but it's subtraction by addition. Here's how he emptied himself. He quite literally emptied himself in the sense that he poured himself out for humanity. He didn't relinquish or give up his divine nature. He simply added to his person a human nature that was vulnerable, weak, and nothing in the way that human natures are compared to God. Here's the doctrine of the two natures in the one person of Christ, very briefly. Christ is one person who exists eternally in two natures, a divine nature with all of the prerogatives continuing to function of divinity and a human nature with all of the vulnerabilities and continuing to function in humanity. So he is simultaneously, when he was incarnate in Mary's womb, a divine-natured and a human-natured person. And since the divine nature never has any vulnerability, Paul can rightly say the adding of a human nature to his person can rightly be described as becoming nothing and emptying yourself because he truly became that nothing. He didn't cease to be God. He continued to function with all the prerogatives of deity in his person, but his human nature functioned as a true human without any limitations or mitigations or enhancements because he was divine. It was a true human nature. It wasn't a deified human nature. It wasn't a superhuman nature. It was a human nature that can be described appropriately as pouring out himself, his person, for his people. It was a self-giving by taking on this vulnerability. He made himself nothing. Didn't cease to be God. He just added a human nature, and that could be rightly described as making himself nothing. He took on the form, there's that word again, all of the essential characteristics of. All of the necessary characteristics of. He didn't just look like a human. He actually had all the characteristics of a human. And this is the glory of his incarnational humility. P.T. O'Brien says it this way. He did not exchange the nature or form of God for that of a slave. Instead, listen to this. He displayed the nature or form of God in the nature or form of a slave, thereby showing clearly not only what his character was like, but also what it meant to be God. Hard to understand, I know. But the glory of it, the majesty of it is this. God the Son, the equal of God the Father, voluntarily chose to take to himself our humanity. The nature of one whose whole purpose is to serve rather than to be served. It's important that for God and for Jesus, the form of a servant and humanity is one and the same thing. To be a human in the eyes of God is to be a possession of God himself called to serve. That is the definition of being human according to God. When Jesus became a man, he became a servant. He became a human servant of God. That's valuable insight for all of us. What does it mean to be a man or a woman? What does it mean to be human? It means to be called to be a servant of God. It means to be called as God's own possession with no rights to yourself, with no rights to your future, with no rights to your desires and dreams, but so that all that we have belongs to the one who made us. And Jesus made himself that in our place. This is the humility of God the Son. He took to himself all of the vulnerability of humanity. The one who was all-powerful took to himself weakness. The one who was all-wise took to himself the limitations of knowledge. The one who was all-knowing took to himself the experience of mystery. This was the humility of God the Son. Incredible. Here is more than the king that goes to the front line in place of his lowest soldier. 
Here is more than the farmer who takes the place of his plow horse. Here is more than a president who takes his post at the lowest federal office. Here is God the Son, the eternal, all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing, radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, taking carbon and water and mystery and pain and abandonment. Here is the glory of his humility. God the Son takes on flesh and teeth and a tongue and a brain and a liver and an appendix and eating and drinking with all the vulnerabilities of disease. He takes all of these things on because his essential nature was non-grasping but giving. And yet Paul still is not done. He is not done yet. There's another room of treasure still to detect lying at our feet. Notice Paul keeps going. Being found in human form, he humbled himself further. Not content to just experience the degradations of a human nature for one who is divine. Not content to stop merely at having to breathe oxygen, he humbled himself yet further. He went even lower. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. So the life giver will experience life being extinguished. The creator will be crushed. He will be obedient. He will go even to death. He will lower himself to the indignity of being extinguished. The self-existent one will experience a demise. The eternal one will experience an end. The one who has no beginning will experience a stopping point in his human nature by death. And his obedience to his father will render him to count the joy set before him worthy even of death. And yet still, Paul is not done. Even death on a cross. Consider the passage. The form of God experiences death on a cross. The one who is equal to God himself experiences death, and not just death, death on a cross. Death in the most scandalous, atrocious, horrific, cruel way possible. Death that was the scandal of both Greeks and Jews. Death that was the representation of God's curse on mankind. Death that represented the enemies of God being crushed by God. This was the death that he willingly embraced in his servant-heartedness to fulfill the mission that he and the Father had planned to rescue sinners who had sinned against God and who must pay the wages of that sin. This was the humility of God the Son. He took the worst death possible. He humbled himself to the greatest scandal. He was ultimately humiliated. He was ultimately rejected. He took on himself the ultimate humiliation. Why? Because sinners needed to be saved, and their humiliation must become his own, and their curse must become his own, and their lowliness to the bottom rung of God's wrath must become his own. And so he takes it on himself in the ultimate display of humiliation for God the Son. G. Walter Hansen describes this. This is a lengthy quote, but I, I just think it's worth it. I'd like to encourage you to just let these phrases wash over you in the context that the one we are talking about is the equal of God himself. He is God the Son. He says this, Like the crescendo on a drum roll, the reverberation of the word death brings the first half of the hymn to a deafening silence before the cross. 
The last word to be heard is the word cross. Death on a cross was not a heroic death, a noble death, but a shameful death, a disgraceful death. The cross displayed the lowest depths of human depravity and cruelty. It exhibited the most brutal form of sadistic torture and execution ever invented by malicious human minds. Roman law reserved the cross for the worst criminals and the most violent insurrectionists. A Roman citizen would never be executed by crucifixion. Cicero called death on a cross a most cruel and disgusting punishment. The cross is the worst extreme of the tortures inflicted upon slaves. To bind a Roman citizen is a crime. To flog him is an abomination. To slay him is almost an act of murder. To crucify him is what? There is no fitting word that can possibly describe so horrible a deed. For a Christian in a Roman colony like Philippi, the phrase death on a cross would emphasize the abject degradation of Christ's lowly obedience and drive home the lesson that his identification with men reached the lowest rung of the ladder. No greater contrast can be imagined than the contrast between the first and the last lines of the first half of the hymn. Existing in the form of God, death on a cross. Who is God the Son? He is the one who emptied himself by taking on our nature and humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. For Greeks, the cross was a scandalous abomination. For Jews, it represented the anathema, the condemnation of God against his enemies. In the book of Joshua, which we've been reading, as I said, as a family, the kings that were cursed of God and rejected were hung on a tree as a way of displaying for all who could see them. This is the end of those who would defy God. This is the end of those who would attempt and dare to fight against God's people. This is the end of those who refuse to call Yahweh the Lord. This is how they will end, under God's curse. They are absolutely decimated. Their armies are gone. They are vanquished completely. Their cities are rubble, and their kings are displayed in a, in a exhibition of God's absolute power over his enemies. And that is the type of death that God the Son embraced. This is the humility of God the Son. This is our Savior. This is what he did to save us. He would grasp nothing in the end except humility itself and the love of his Father and the people that the triune God had purposed to rescue. He would be crucified for the slaves of sin, and he would die the death of a criminal slave himself under God's curse in their place. To the eyes of the church, this familiar scene is no ordinary hilltop. It is a place of unspeakable glory. It is a place where the wisdom of God is displayed. It is a place where the nature of God as an outpouring God is, dis is displayed. It is a, a place where we can most clearly see the very eternal nature of God himself who loves those even who are his enemies. Here is no ordinary ground. Here is the ground of a treasure beyond all treasures. Here is the ground where the humility of God the Son is poured out for sinners to vindicate the righteousness and to demonstrate the love of God the Father. Here is the anthem of angels. Here is the center of heaven's worship. Here is the humility of God the Son displayed. Here, right here, is the Lamb that will be exalted above all things. The cross of Christ, the window of divine glory, the glory that is his humility, which will be triumphantly vindicated in the end. Brothers and sisters, here is a sight, a sight for our wandering eyes. It's a place to plant our restless feet. Here is a treasure 
to dig into every day the saving humility of Jesus Christ, the humble death of Christ on his cross. And my friends, if you do not know Jesus or you think he is just a teacher of nice morality, get to know him here where he suffers for sinners like you. Get to know him here where he offers you forgiveness for your sins. Get to know him here where he is more humble than the most self-defacing popular person in the culture. He is more exposed than any transparent parent person in this culture. He exposes himself to the punishment of God and offers that punishment for you and for your sins. This is a man worth knowing. This is a God worth knowing. This is a God worth casting aside your sins in order to have him and his righteousness and his glory. Here is no ordinary ground. Here is a sight more glorious than all the treasures in this world. Here is a glory wide enough to flood our souls with light and our hearts with endless gratefulness and our own lives with humility. Treasure, glory in the saving humility of Jesus Christ and in a humble act of worship, reflect that humility in your minds from one to another. Let's pray. invite Rob to come up and I'd like us to sing There's No One Like You one more time before we close. Lord Jesus, there is no one like you. Lord, we are proud. You are humble. Lord, we are arrogant, but you, Lord, are, Lord, debased and despised freely and willingly in our place. And now, Lord, you are exalted. On your throne and in our hearts, you are exalted. For your humility, the saving humility that was yours for eternity and displayed in your humanity and especially on your cross, you are exalted in heaven and in our hearts. You are treasured. You are glorified. And it is our honor to reflect even the smallest glimpse of you and to lift up your song. We stand here on this ground of this treasure and we say, there is no song we could sing. There are no words we could speak that could adequately express the glory of your humility. What kind of God is this who gives himself to save his enemies? What kind of God is this who offers himself to pay for his own punishment? What kind of God is this who exalts the lowly and lowers himself to rescue them? Our God. We exalt in you. Receive our praise in Jesus name